Good morning. Uh, it is good to be with you today. Uh, so glad you are here uh, on this particular Sunday. Um, I always say you should know that you are welcome, that you are loved, uh, that you are safe, and that God is well pleased with you. The sun uh, was setting. The people were arriving, many happy faces, excited for what was to come. Children of all ages, of many ethnicities and races, entering the sanctuary, carrying their Easter egg baskets and flashlights. The sanctuary of this church was overflowing with many first-time visitors, more than what can count. The music began to play. The families took their seats in the anticipated mood of solemn and mourning of the Good Friday service began to fade away. One could say the anticipated religious plans and matters went out the window. God was doing a new thing. The intensity, the vibrancy of the room was palpable, as it should be, with nearly 400 people in attendance and more than half of them small children. So the pastor did the unexpected thing the unpopular thing, he responded to God and pivoted. He put the 400 visitors, children, youth, parents, grandparents, visitors, above the planned religious matters. After all, a Good Friday service is a Christian religious commemoration of the death of Jesus Christ, albeit meaningful and special. Still, the question one must wrestle with, when are religious rules more important than life-giving wholeness? When do religious matters in the assembly take more precedent than the wholeness of children's minds and hearts? Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In the service, the children were invited to come down from their seats to pick up a stone, and they did so. Almost all the children did. Later, they were asked to bring back the stone and place it in front of the cross, and they did so. On that evening, they learned the goodness of the cross, the good in Good Friday. After the service, they hunted for Easter eggs with their flashlights, received prizes, candy. They laughed, smiled, sat around on the lawn, appreciated the evening, and enjoyed the wholeness of life. You should know the pastor of this story is me, and the church is ours. We experienced such a blessing earlier this year. But I tell you about this today because I believe it embodies today's gospel reading. Today's sermon is titled, Human Wholeness Above Everything. You know, as we read today's gospel reading, I wonder what feelings were invoked in you today. Through these characters, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, unable to stand up straight for 18 years, crippled by a spirit a disabling spirit. In other words, her condition was not medical, but a demonic one. Did you hear me? We have not fully understood the demonic things, but one cannot be naive because the power of evil is true. The reality of human suffering is undeniable. So can you imagine with me how this woman felt? The pain, the suffering, the lack of ableism, probably judged by many, rejected by many, not part of the society like many, emotionally and mentally taxed. But yet Jesus, oh Jesus, sees her, calls her, lays hands on her, and tells her, woman, you are set free. I mean, surely such words could become a rally cry for feminist liberation theology, but we won't go down that road today. 
Instead, Jesus performs a miracle. The woman is healed, able to stand up straight, freed, and begins to praise God. Now one has to wonder, does any true encounter with Jesus lead to immediate healing and restoration? But how could such a healing moment lead to criticism and conflict? I'll say that again. How could such a healing moment lead to criticism and conflict? Well, the synagogue's leader's response was indignant. You caught that? He was livid. And instead of speaking directly to Jesus, he avoids confrontation at all costs. Speaks out to the crowd as though Jesus is not in the room. Very cowardly. Like many speak out on social media cowardly. Yet the essence of his cowardice, the essence of his anger, is purely religious. Did you hear me? Purely religious. By defending the Sabbath, a day of religious matters, he attempts to justify his stance against Jesus doing the work of healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus quickly Claps back, saying to the whole synagogue and to the leader, because apparently many others agreed with him, you hypocrites, you too work on the Sabbath. Come on. Yet, they realized they were humiliated in that moment. The entire crowd rejoiced with this woman that was healed. And in this space this morning, in this kind of uh, uh, moment, we invite the Holy Spirit, the one who has come to counsel, to guide, to help, the one who's come to intercede for us. We call upon that presence in this moment. Because today's wisdom is for all the true students of Jesus. For all those who are willing to rethink it all, to reconsider it all. And here's the wisdom those who place the wholeness of humanity above everything else, even religious matters, truly honor God. I don't want you to miss that. That those who place the wholeness of humanity above everything else, even the religious practices, rules, and regulations, truly honor God. It is what Jesus would do if he was here today physically. I mean, do you know how many times Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath? Do you know how many times Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath and in a synagogue? Well, let's count them. He healed this woman right here. He healed a man with an unclean spirit in a synagogue in Capernaum. He healed another man who had a withered hand in the synagogue. Then he healed another man who had another disease, in another synagogue. Are you catching on? Apparently Jesus is making the same point over and over and over again. But see, the Sabbath is not in question. The religious law is not in question. Rather, what is in question is how the Sabbath is being practiced. And for Jesus... The religious practice of Sabbath was about saving lives, healing hearts, minds, and bodies. And the scene of this woman being healed and beginning to praise God. Well, that's the very meaning of Sabbath. Do you know what Sabbath means? It means to praise God, to begin praising God. And so Jesus was practicing Sabbath to its fullest meaning. And notice the contrast between the woman in the synagogue leader. Two very different landings to the miracle. The woman praises God and the synagogue leader hinders God. Did you hear? You see, I guess what I'm saying to you this morning is that a moment arrives when Jesus has to make a decision about what's happening to this woman. Not one more day would pass that this woman would continue to suffer. If it was up to the synagogue leader, 
he would let her suffer for another 18 years. And unfortunately, in our world today, too many religious things, too many religious practices, matters, too many religious words, too many religious expectations, somehow begin to side with the powers of evil. Did you hear me? That somehow this synagogue leader, by defending the Sabbath, by defending this religious practice, somehow begins to become an agent of the powers of evil. Are you hearing me? Could it be that some of us, because of our religious practices, because of our religious tone, because of our expectations, what we think it should be, knowingly and unknowingly begin to side with the powers of evil. Oh, man. Did you hear me? I, what I'm saying this morning is not easy to hear. I wonder how much have we learned from our ancestors, from generations before us. Take, for example, the colonizers of America. They defeated and defended their religious matters, their religious documents, using them to justify their oppression and genocide of indigenous peoples. And therefore sided with the evil powers, with the demonic powers at work. I mean, what is truly bent out of shape in this gospel reading? Is it the woman's body or is it the actions of the religious people? You may say to me, Pastor Moses, why do you speak against the American Christian church? Why speak about the historical and present sins and ills of the American Christian church? Why all this talk about the sins against, by Christianity against indigenous peoples, LGBT peoples, people of color, the black community, about, uh, against immigrants, against women, against other people groups? Why? Why? Because not one more day of suffering or oppression for these precious and beautiful souls shall pass. Amen. Not one more day. Yeah, yeah, for that was worth a clap. <laughs> Not one more day shall pass of people being bound to the evil powers of this world. Not one more day shall we allow the religious powers to be over people. Yeah, it's clear to me that Christianity, and not only in America, but in the whole world, knowingly and unknowingly has aligned itself with the powers of evil that oppress, that reject, that abuse. And it has, it's like this boot of the empire is placed on the neck of people groups in this world. Racism, discrimination, homophobia, genocide. You know, I think of the thousands of migrants that this morning are caravanning full-on families from Africa, Haiti, Colombia, Venezuela, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico, just to name a few nations, traveling through dangerous conditions, inhumane conditions. You know, the United Nations came out with a report saying that international migration has increased from 8% in 2019 to 43% in 2021. And I can imagine that that number is even higher today. And the motivating factors are not only legitimate, but concerning. It's food insecurity, it's violence, it's crime, it's severe droughts, severe rains related to climate shock, and it's poverty. You know, I would also migrate if my family was enduring such things. The hope of an American dream, even if it meant losing my life, even if it meant endangering my life, would be well worth it. Anything to remove the boots of empire from my neck. And yet one still hears chance in this country of build a wall. We still hear stories of how the funding and building of the wall continues under the current administration. 
the hypocrisy. <laughs> Jesus would not allow it, not another day of pain, not another day of suffering, not another day of oppression or religious hypocrisy. There was a new world order breaking in, and if I do not speak out on it, if you do not speak out on it, the rocks will cry out. Creation will speak out of the injustice and of the wrongdoings. Silence is not a virtue. We shall not bow down to religious people. We will shall not bow down to the churchy people. We will bow down to the Savior of the world. The Messiah, the one who has come to replace the Sabbath, the one who has come to free us from religiosity, the one who stands up for us, gets up, protects his children, reminds us what truly honors God in the Sabbath is lifting up the wholeness of people. We honor people, not systems. We honor people, not religion. The Sabbath is a day to set the captives free. It's a day to feed the hungry, to serve the poor, to heal the sick and brokenhearted, to proclaim a new world order is breaking in. You know, listen, I, I know it's not easy to listen to these things. And perhaps we have forgotten this truth. Perhaps you have been part of the religious, of the churchy people, becoming allies and agents of the power of evil, and have forgotten this lesson have forgotten this teaching. Or perhaps this is the first time you're ever hearing about this. Nevertheless, we can all repent today. You know the meaning of repentance, right? It comes from the Greek word mera naeo. Mera means after, naeo means to think. You put those together after you think or to rethink. Repentance means to rethink things, to reconsider things, to change one's mind for the better. It can be said that repentance, after rethinking it all, one comes to one's senses. You see, I wonder how many of us need to rethink this whole thing. How many of us need to repent of it all? We are complicit. We are uh, culpable. We have benefited. It is time for the wholeness of humanity to be placed above all things. Why would we do such a thing? Because it is what Jesus, the owner of it all, would want from us. As his stewards in the in-between of life. I love Jesus. He does not remain silent. He does not stand by and watch the oppression and watch uh, the injustice. Uh -uh. He stands up and he speaks out. And not only does he speak out, but he's willing to give his life for it. Demonstrated Sabbath by dying on a cross takes away our sins, burdens, mistakes, failures, our religiosity, and gives us his forgiveness, gives us his grace, his successes, his righteousness, and resurrected on the third day to give us the greatest day, to give us this, this apex of reality, this omega point of history. And he liberates us, heals us, and makes us whole again. <laughs> what shall we do with such wholeness? What shall we do with such love? No longer crippled, no longer disabled, no longer a migrant, but fully welcome and loved. Perhaps all one can do is spend one's life, give one's life, share one's life to see the wholeness of humanity back again. Oh God, we come to ask that you would help us to rethink it all to repent from it all, to usher in a new world order where people matter more than religion, where wholeness and healing of humanity become a priority. No more bondage, no more suffering, no more oppression, not one more day. This is our prayer. This is our cry. Help us to rethink it all. And all of God's people said, Amen.